takes him a little while to. All right. Turn with me to Psalm, and this is this is an exciting day today. Turn with me to Psalm two. <laughs> we are moving madly forward like a herd of snails. <clears throat> Psalm 2. All right, I think I'll just read the whole thing if that's all right with everyone. Why do the heathen rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. He who sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his great displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen, or the nations, for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise <clears throat> now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they who put their trust in him. <clears throat> all right. Now, get ready. This is the primary statement of the whole night. I see that this psalm is talking about the cross and the resurrection. Okay? Now, listen, listen to my... Listen, listen to this. I see the rage of the nations... I see that as all the people that railed on Jesus when he hung on the cross. Okay, I mean, just hear my words. All right? And God laughing, I see that as the resurrection where he raised him from the dead. <clears throat> now, let me make this statement, having said that. Some people say to me, Randy, you see the cross in every scripture when that is not what it's talking about, okay? So you heard the scripture, you've probably read it before, and yet boldly I stand up here and say that this is talking about the cross and the resurrection, <clears throat> you know? And is there not the possibility that my leaning is toward teaching the cross and the resurrection and therefore I see it in everything when it's not there. I mean, is, is that, let me just ask that, is that possible? And the answer would be, yes, it is possible. Okay, so now having begun like what we did and said what I said and said my piece, <clears throat> let's save your place right here and let's go over to the book of Acts, chapter 4. We'll read a little bit here, because I want you to see a certain circumstance that was set up. We'll start at verse 5. This is Acts, chapter 4, verse 5. <clears throat> and this is... Um, this is immediately following the incident where the guy was, uh, you know, where Peter shared a sermon and healed this guy. And, um, and so it begins in verse 5. Um, and it came to pass on the next day that their rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the, in, the mid, in the midst, now this is when they had set these disciples in the midst, Peter and 
so it's like, they ask, by what power or by what name have you done this? <clears throat> then Peter, let, let's see, let's just skip that because he, he begins to declare the Lord. In verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Let's drop down to verse 16. <clears throat> this is uh, the, the Sanhedrin again, or the, the, really the high priests and their friends. Verse 16, they're speaking, saying, What should we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them it is manifest to all those who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it, but that it spread no further among the people. Let us threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now drop down to verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. <clears throat> Verse 22. Um, for the man was above 40 years old, on whom this miracle of he healing was shown. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God who hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? Does this sound vaguely familiar to anybody? They're quoting the second Psalm. Now, let's continue to listen. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Now they're speaking, and of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the heathen, with the nations, and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. <clears throat> and we'll just stop right there. Interestingly enough, The disciples were in the word of God and they saw that what happened to Jesus, they saw that as the fulfillment of the second psalm. Now again, if you weren't of this place <laughs> and I stood up in front of you and said, and read the second psalm and said, this is all about Christ and him crucified. Most people would say, no, it's not. They would have said, no, no, it, no, it didn't. And you just leaned too heavily in that direction. Well, guess what? So did Peter and John. Apparently, they leaned heavily that way, too, so heavy that they saw the cross and they saw the resurrection in these situations also. And so they are literally interpreting the rage of the nations or the rage of the heathens, however you want to translate that word. Um, in the New Testament, they're interpreting that rage as actions that hung Jesus on the cross. That's what it said. And uh, well, let's, uh, verse 27, for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pilate with the nations and the people were gathered together to what, and it goes on to talk about <clears throat> what they did to him and what is it that Pontius Pilate and Herod and all of them did? Well, they hung him on a cross. <clears throat> and so they interpreted that the rage of the nations is not, let me just say it like this, not random rage. It is specific to the cross. It is specific. And it is not only specific to Jesus, but in these scriptures, they included the rage as actions against the people of, uh, the people of God, those who uh, reach out against the body of Christ, those who reach out against those who preach it. Um, and so the only category that this rage falls into is in relationship to the cross, either directly on Jesus are to those that are preaching the cross. Now we would, 
we live in a world outside of Christ and him crucified. Not necessarily we, but many Christians. They're not surrounded with the reality that God is surrounded with, and that is that the, anything outside of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ has no validity. It is all based on him. Everything that counts, everything that is anything, is based on, the, on Christ and him crucified, or Christ and him raised, and us in union with him. Okay. So that includes you and I. Okay. That includes you and I. But we are listening here, and this is important, folks, if you tried to go back in church history, Mallory told me that she got a, a book, or let, what did she get from your father or whoever it was, all the church fathers, was it just a bunch of notes or something? Wasn't that you said you got a CD, that's what it was, a CD full of writings of the early church fathers, and, and, you, and so you would go, well, let's go through that and find the truth. Well, folks, you don't need to go back any further than either Jesus or the guys that were directly with Jesus at the time. And they're speaking to us right now. We don't need church fathers after them or after them or after them. These are the original church fathers, the original 12, the original apostles. And they are, and, and this is something that we will find out in our this short class and the next one that we have as we end uh, <laughs> next week, uh, the, the sharing on Psalms, and probably have to go another semester, would you think? Um, <clears throat> but we will find that the book of Acts heavily leans on the Psalms to interpret the cross and the resurrection, which is an amazing fact because most Christians don't go there. They don't even, if you want personal comfort, you go to the Psalms. If they wanted the cross, they went to the Psalms. Isn't that amazing? And, but it is true. And I'll, in one of our classes, I will just take you right on through so that we'll get a good taste of that so that we can really see that that is the case. And so, um, you know, here, here we are. We are hearing from them, and they are explaining the Old Testament scriptures in light of the cross. But, folks... Now, come on, think about this. How many people only consider something that is obvious, like, for example, in the Psalms, when Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We would say, that, that's related to the cross. And we would go through and we'd find 15 or 10 or five sayings that directly happened at the cross. Are you following me? and say that relates to the cross, but nothing else does. But these guys didn't do that. They had no body, they had, they had no body telling them it was that. From the Holy Spirit that had fallen on them, he began to open the spirit, I mean open the, the scriptures and guide them into all truth. Well, Christ is all truth. And so they had no problem taking a whole psalm that, that never said crucified, that never had a saying from the cross, that never seemed in the natural to point to it, and they had no problem at all because they had seen it from the Holy Spirit. That's their authority. The Holy Spirit's interpretation of the scriptures. <clears throat> now, they were, they were Christians just like us. I, I guess I shouldn't insult them. They may be listening. That great cloud of witnesses saying, no, we ain't nothing like what you guys are nowadays. But they were Christians in the sense that they believed all the things we believe, but they tended to, I mean, and, and we'll, like I said, we'll check this out throughout certainly the book of Acts. They tended to speak of Christ and him crucified over and over and over. That's what they spoke of. That was their emphasis. That's what they saw in the scriptures. So I don't feel so bad. Because Peter went before and did this, and here's proof. And Paul went before and did this. 
And I don't need to hear, I mean, and I know this is all Christ-centered and Jesus spoke of the vine branch relationship and all of that kind of stuff over and over. So I don't really need any more company than that. You understand what I'm saying? All I need to know is, is this the heart of God? Is this the word of God? Is this, is this founded upon Christ crucified and the foundation of the apostles and prophets? And the answer is, it certainly is. More so than a whole lot of other teaching. Amen. More so than a whole lot of other teaching. All right. And so, um, in, uh, let's see, I just lost my spot over there in Psalm. <clears throat> Psalm 2. Look, look, uh, with me, let's see, it's uh, verse 7. Psalm 2, verse 7. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now, verse 7 of Psalm 2. I said to you when we first began, this is dealing with the resurrection of Christ. This is dealing with the resurrection of Christ. Now let's go to a different place in the book of Acts. Keep your place in Psalm 2 because we'll need to be going back and forth a lot. Let's go to Acts 13. We were just in Acts 4. Let's go to Acts 13. You may. And it should be the way it's revealed to us, too. I mean, in truth, we're supposed to be related to the Lord in the same way. But we say he's invisible, so we can't. Well, you know, he's more real. The spirit realm is more real than the material realm. The spirit realm created the material realm. So why is the material realm so real to us? <clears throat> All right, good, good point, Shay. Um, in uh, Acts... Chapter 13, verse uh, 32, and I'll skip a whole bunch of what it's saying here, but. And we declare unto you glad tidings how the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. There it is that the, that the interpretation of the second psalm in one spot over here was dealing with the first part, which was the death. On the second half of the psalm, it's dealing with the resurrection, but in a whole different place where they're emphasizing that. And they're saying that when this statement is made in the second psalm, verse 7, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, they are saying this is a direct reference to the resurrection of Christ and is a proof of the promise to the fathers that is now fulfilled with us. In other words, they had some sort of a weird theological mind that was formed in the fashion that everything was going to be fulfilled by Christ and that, that all other things were just sort of laid out there to give a picture of Christ, to give a picture of his death, to give a picture of his resurrection. But those things were not what was really important or real. Even the literal meaning that were given, for example, the prophets saying certain things during certain times, and there was a literal meaning to that. But folks, they were also declaring Christ. 
And here again, we're getting a, a I mean, in, the, in this case, they're literally saying, as it is said in the second psalm. So they're saying, and they believe this, and this must have been something that they fellowship in regularly, that somebody somewhere, probably after they received the Holy Spirit in the upper room, opened their Bible, got into the second psalm and said, oh my God, this was said by David thousands of years ago, but it's speaking about us. It's being fulfilled in our time by Christ through the death and through the resurrection. Incredible. Incredible. Hallelujah. And so, um, but, but it's saying, this is my son, how's it worded? Uh, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And I won't get into that too much other than to say, <clears throat> it's, he's saying that he was begotten again at the resurrection. Because wasn't he the only begotten son before that? But in the resurrection, he's not called the only begotten anymore. He's called the firstborn among many brethren. He's called the firstborn from the dead. But now he's viewed in a different light. Now he is no longer an individual. The only, the, that, that Jesus contained in that one physical body, that was the only begotten son. But when Jesus went to the cross, he died, folks. Now, I, I, I know that we don't understand that. That Jesus died. And when he arose, yes, the nature, the person that was on the inside is still alive, is raised up. But there was a death to something of Jesus, and there was a resurrection of something of Jesus. The death was Jesus' death. To, as the only begotten, the only seed, the only one after its kind, the only true seed of God, and everyone else served God, maybe loved God, had faith in God, but they were not the seed of God. They were fallen creatures, and the only one that was truly out from God was Jesus, who was the light of the world, and everything else in the world was darkness. Okay? But, in the resurrection, in the resurrection, we came up with him as his body. Not as a bunch of individuals, but as his body. And as his body now, this, you know, thou art my son. This is what God is declaring to the resurrected Jesus. This day have I begotten you. Well, why is he begetting him again? Why didn't he just die and then get up and then God say, you know, you're my only begotten and you're still my only begotten. Because there was a death. That Jesus died and the one that arose was different in the sense that he now included us as members of who he is. One with him. Okay. His life and every member, his life and every part. But by no means the only anymore. By no means the only anymore. It's because we are one with him. And so you can say, we use this term, you know, I, I use it. I use it from way back when the Lord showed me something, a many-membered body. I use that term to show that there are many who are one. But I also use the phrase that the one is many. And that means that Jesus in his nature and in his life is in many. Okay. So it's, it's true that this resurrection is God glorying in the resurrected son, which includes you and I being raised with him from the dead. And now he's not the only begotten. Now he's the firstborn among many. And when God looks at Jesus now, seated at the right hand of God, he doesn't just see that physical incarnated body sitting in that throne. And I'm saying, you know, challenge me. 
challenge what I'm saying. Nobody says this kind of stuff. Challenge me. I, you know, I mean, in your mind, challenge me. But, but find the answer, because here is the answer. The one seated at the right hand of the Father is not the single incarnated unit called Jesus of Nazareth. It is what the scriptures declare in Ephesians and what God planned from before the foundation of the world. And he says, and you and I were raised up together with Christ. We were, when he was raised, we were raised. But it's more than that. We were made to sit together in heavenly places where? In a big throne. No, not in a big throne. In a, in a really huge throne, it's got to be so big it can hold many. No, there's only one. And it's the one, Jesus, in his many-membered body. And when it says we were raised up with him, we were raised up as one. We, it wasn't like 80 million little spots went, you know, and rose with him. It is simply one was raised and we were raised with him. And we were made to sit together in heavenly places. Where? Around the throne? Why? Why? I mean, I know that we get that picture from the book of Revelation, but folks, the book of Revelation doesn't define now doctrine. Do you understand what I mean? If, you know, I believe that it does, but I'm going to say it like that. I'm going I'm to go ahead and figure that most people still think that the book of Revelation is about end time event. I personally don't believe that. I believe that it is exactly what it says, the very first verse. The book of the revelation, not revelations, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then it goes through. And one of the strongest reasons why I believe that is my own daughter, Nisi, has shared over and over over the years incredible realities out of that book that, that show that there is a true spiritual meaning and application that all of that relates to. And that if we miss Jesus, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't want to miss the rapture. That's what people say. I don't want to miss the rapture. Okay. Well, okay, are you just as concerned about not missing Jesus? I mean, there is a difference. But if you don't want to miss Jesus, then don't miss him in the book of Revelation. <laughs> you know, but then you're showing your true colors. You don't really care about not missing Jesus. You just don't want to miss the rapture. Let me tell you, I, I, this is the honest truth. I'd rather be down here going through what people call great tribulation, if that was even the case, that this horrible, great, I'd rather be down here and with Jesus than up there and without him. You know, and I, I you know why I believe that? <clears throat> because I needed Jesus when I got saved. I didn't need salvation from hell. When I found Jesus, I needed him right now, right in me. I needed immediate help, not future, long-term, thousands of years help. That would not have done me any good. Now, I know a lot of other people, they're satisfied. Not me, man. I needed to find a Jesus that was a very present help. Amen. And... So I began to find him. And I began to find more and more and more because I kept trying to make, I, my original thing was trying to get him to fix me so I wouldn't have any problems. I, and I guess that's not true. My original discourse was trying to get him to fix you so I wouldn't have any problems. <laughs> that's, that's more, I mean, isn't that, I mean, that is, that's more true Probably first baby steps, you know. Wah, fix them. You know, fix him. He made an ugly face at me. Fix that, you know. And, and try to get God. And then I began to realize, not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I'm the one that needs help. And then I realized, I don't need help. I don't need no stinking badges. I need, I need, 
I need to be crucified so that Christ can live and he doesn't need any help. He doesn't need any help. The biggest problem to having Jesus live in somebody else is it's a crowded room. We're in there too. You know, it's a crowded house. We go flop down on the couch and don't give him any room. We take control of the remote. We control the vertical and the horizontal. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> someday somebody will go back and figure out all the allusions to different movies and stuff. You know, I'll go, man, there's a lot of them in there. But I mean, that, you know, it is true. We're, as long as we're alive, we're going to have problems. And if you think, and this is, I'm, I'm just saying this, and, and I know that this won't apply or even affect you until that day that you're in over your head. Because right now, you probably think you can handle it. But when the day comes that it is just, God has just quit doing miracles and quit doing this and he quit doing that because... He's no longer trying to make your life down here comfortable. He is trying to get his son out of you. And if you're not going to go along with it, he's going to try to get your attention. And he will do it. He will do it. He will do it. And so, you know, all the fun stops and, and all the scary rides start. You know. But... You got to remember when that happens what is his heart. He loves you. He's not trying to destroy you. He hasn't given up on you. He hasn't forsaken you. He just is trying to bring you to an end of yourself so that you can come to the glorious reality Christ in you. That's really the basis of Psalm 2. I mean, I believe it. I'll show it towards the end when we, when we get there. That, uh, that is what I believe is the basis. <clears throat> so when he's saying, this day have I begotten thee, this is, this is a new man that has arisen. It's not the same man that walked the earth. It's a new man. Do you believe it? Yeah. Well, if you believe it, you know, and uh, you know, I have to ask this. I didn't, I didn't, when I said, do you believe it? I don't mean, do you believe it theologically? Because you can believe things theologically that can have no effect, no power in your life. Oh, I believe that a new man rose from the dead. But when you get into trials and circumstances, you start whining to God to fix you. He said, I thought you believed that you were dead and Christ is your life. And when he raised up, you were his body. And that's the one he lives through. Well, oh, I believe that theologically, but just help me, help my flesh. You know, help my flesh. And, and he said, I already helped your flesh 2,000 years ago. I, I helped it to the cross. Come on, old man. You, you're going to have a hard time getting up there. Come on, old man. Let's get up there. Come on, I'll help you up on the cross. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified. You know? And so these have to become life-changing realities. They have to, they have to, they have to. Why? Why do they have to? Because I would hate the thought of being one who is supplying the world with people who can preach this, but the reality of it is not in their life. That does not, that, that scares me. And it's, I mean, it, it is turning me more and more and more toward, you know, something's got to give here. Something's got to give here. And I think the Lord is slowly opening my eyes. I'm, I'm 60 years old now. Finally get my eyes open. How long is it going to take you? <laughs> you know, the hope would be that you would progress further. But I believed that if you preach the truth and people said, Amen. And people could say it back to you that they were getting it. And I don't believe that anymore. I was, uh, uh, I was thinking about Pilgrim's Progress. And there was this guy that went along with, with uh, Christian. His, his name was Pliable. 
flood. And I mean, he was just like, Christian sharing all this stuff with him. He's going, yeah, 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 oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it hit me, if he's pliable to this, he's probably pliable to whatever comes along. Do you understand what I mean? In other words, he's not getting this. He's pliable to it, but he's not getting it. And if something else comes along, he'll be pliable and can be molded to that. And I thought, you know, I mean, it's just my dumb, 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 da dumb, dumb head that says, oh, they're getting it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I say, oh, they're getting it because they're going, you know, <sighs> you know? And nobody is getting Christ as government unless they're willing to lay down their life in a real way. Not just say, oh, I died at the cross. No, you say, I'm dying right now. I am not going with my way. Not my will. Not I, but Christ. Not I. And I tell you what, somebody's got to rein you in because nobody else will do that on a, a regular basis. I know that because the school at one time, was a, the screws were a lot tighter. And so people couldn't get away with as much, but they were still just as carnal underneath as... Do you understand what I mean? It, the, even though, you know, n you know, everybody will get away with as much as they can unless they really want the Lord and they say, I really want the Lord. I do. And even though I could create and come up with a sneaky way, hello, of getting around this, that's not Jesus. You're not going to do that anymore. That's right. You know, one of the stories that I, I tell is when I first came to the Lord, I used methods that I used before I came to the Lord. I had little ways of surviving, and I think we all do. I think we've all developed ways in life before we came to the Lord that worked for us that were, you know, uh, helped us survive. And my ways were really good. I mean, they were. They were really good. I mean, I really got over. I was the guy that landed on his feet. I was the guy that got through stuff. I can tell you stories that you just go, no way. You know? I mean, I, I had the system. And it was really, it made me feel like I was a, a, a superpower, a, a superhero. I had abilities that other people didn't have okay now those abilities are any number of things that are ugly but you know we would call them you know you know because the outward is you're getting by and so when i when i came to the lord and walked for a while i realized oh my god you know what some of this stuff that, that i'm using is not the lord i'm still depending on the same stuff i depended on before i came to the lord and i'm afraid to give it up because and here's the kicker i would have to become human like everybody else or i would have to become vulnerable like everybody else and I didn't want that at all and I'm telling you in in my soul no baby that's too big to give that's that's asking a lot right there that's like you know saying the, the enemy is all around and their weapons are powered and you say shields down I'm gonna trust the Lord Shields down. Yeah. And that's what it felt like to me. It was like, it was kind of shields down one third. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's like, this is, I mean, it's scary, 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 because I was going to have to be a regular person that depended on Jesus. Well, I thought that's what being a Christian was all about. But I had found a way to get around that. And the Lord dealt with me through the preaching of Christ and him crucified. Is this, do you want my son, do you want him based on the way I want to give him through the cross and through the resurrection? Do you? Well, you know, if you're sitting in the classroom, of course, you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
if you're going through that kind of stuff, you go, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm sure I do, but I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think I do. Yes, yes, no, I don't know. I mean, it's just confusing. And it's scary, but you know what? I said, in the name of Jesus, I'm, I've got to do this. I will, this, will, this will be a sham, and what I preach and what my life is supposedly given to will be a sham as long as I'm depending on this kind of stuff to get me through. I came to Jesus to, to quit depending on those kind of things, everything from drugs to anything else, you know? And, you know, there have been, there have been times in my walk that people have offered me, you know, prescription drugs to help with my physical situation. And I, I'm telling you right now, I'm in pain, and it hurts. But they would offer that, and they go, you know, and I could see that if I took that, I would take it in a certain way. Not that the drugs are wrong, not that taking them are wrong, if you need that. But for me, I left that. I was using that to get by. Now I'm going to start using prescription drugs in the same way because it's legal. It's okay. It's not legal to have the same spirit I had in the world with illegal drugs. Using those now is not legal to my spirit. It's not legal to the spirit of Christ within me. It's not legal to the one that says, yes, Lord. I want you. I want the cross. And I and and now and let me just double check here. I'm not saying don't take drugs or whatever if you need them. I'm saying for me because of my situation, that's how I got by. Why would I go back to the stuff that I was before Jesus? I'm not going to do that. It's too, it, it would be it would be too big of a compromise for me, and I fear all that I would lose, and then end up being a carnal Christian, which, by the way, I believe is the most miserable person in the world. Amen. I mean, I think I think all out is the best way to be for God, and I think if you're in the world, all out, you know. But don't be lukewarm in any of it. Don't ride the fence. Don't you know? Because it just makes you miserable. And I, I saw, I can make this decision, and I know what that's going to lead to, then this one over here and this one, and then I'm going to end up in the happy little world of carnal Christianity. I said, I can't do it. I don't like it. I don't like carnal Christianity. It's almost to the point where if you just say Christianity, you've covered it. I just, I like Jesus, but I like him enough to lay down my life. You understand what I'm saying? Not lay down my life and go to the mission field. Lay down my life in this situation where I want my own way. And to say, no, hear me, you know, like David. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Hope thou in God. Well, who do you think he's talking to? That's David's spirit talking to his soul. It's saying, look, dude, you are not allowed to sit here and get down and stay down. Why are you cast down? Don't you have any hope? Hope thou in God. Hope thou in God. Well, for us folks, it's better than what David had. Christ in you, the hope of God, the hope of glory. Where you, you get, you know, why are you cast down? Live by Christ. Live from above. And I can, and you've all heard it, so there's no need telling the stories over and over and over again. You know, Peter walking on the water, as long as he looked at Jesus, he didn't sink. He looked at the storm, he sinks. We all know the story. We all still fall into the same trap. You know, it's like, I'm just saying, I'm convinced that good talking doesn't change anybody. I'm convinced that being the most anointed preacher doesn't change anybody. I'm convinced that being able to word it perfectly won't change anybody. Then what the heck changes anybody? Well, first of all, the Lord's the only one who changes anybody. And second of all, when the heart turns to the Lord, somebody's heart has to go, you know what, that's right. Doggone it, that's right. I want the Lord. You know, somebody has to. Who, who will do that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It's not for me to know. I sow the seeds, others water or whatever. That's the order of the Lord. He knows. God brings the increase, but he doesn't just bring the increase randomly. When your heart turns to the Lord, the veil is rent, and you're changed into that same image. But when we're self-protected, I mean, you know, 
if I had been the high priest back then, I would have got to the veil, get ready to go in, and I probably would have wrapped the veil all around me and walked in, you know? I mean, covered myself up, covered, you know, because I know what's in me. But by Christ, you walk in there and you say, you know, somebody says, don't go in there. You're going to die. Well, we happen to believe there's life out of death, but it's his life. See, what, you know, you know. We happen to be those that believe that, you know. Randy, if, if you continue on this route, preaching Christ the way you are, somebody's going to kill you. You mean I might die? Yeah. I thought that's what we preached. I mean, that's what I said to somebody who said that to me. You know, I thought that's what we preach. So not only are you wanting me to protect myself from somebody killing me, but you're wanting me to uh, totally, uh, blatantly disavow everything I've preached for 40 years. I don't think so. You know, I don't think so. Because even if they kill me, God can either raise me from the dead or he can bring forth a resurrection that will bring forth more glory to Jesus around the world. I don't care how it goes. Just bring your glory. Say, that's what the end is. Just bring your glory out of it. <clears throat> All right, so I'm carrying on here, aren't I? Um, Psalm, verse one and, Psalm 2, verse 1 and 2. Why do the... He, then why do the nations rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. <clears throat> That's just, well, we can go ahead to the next verse. Saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. So I'm just going to read a few of my notes so that I don't just keep talking. Uh, in these verses is the reaction in putting him on the cross. But verse 4 through 7 are God's reaction to their actions. He laughs because they cannot keep him down. He who sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Folks, this is talking about the resurrection. Did you know that? That's talking about the resurrection. But I, wanted, I want you to know that it's not talking about God sitting on a throne going, Nya, 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 nya. Na, 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 boo, boo. You can't keep me down. It's not that spirit at all. It is the reality of the resurrection of his son. And I'll, let me just, I'm sure I wrote something. He laughs because they cannot keep him down. He has them in derision over the resurrection. Folks, this acts like he's deriding them with words. But God never said any words. His method was simply to raise Jesus from the dead. And that threw them in derision. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you know, we read that and say, that's about the resurrection. So, man, when God raises me up and shows my enemies that I'm of God and Christ is my life, I'm going to really, you know, deride them. That's not what it's saying. Because God never did that in that sense. The way he did it was through raising his son from the dead. And that's what the New Testament declares. <clears throat> okay. So it says, uh, it says he speaks to them in his wrath and vexes them not by mocking but by raising Jesus from the dead, setting him on his holy hill. Zion is the place of raised oneness that those of the body ask for the nations to come into raised oneness. In verse uh, 9 he says, uh, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Um, I wrote, let the cross and resurrection break them and bring them to in intimacy with Jesus, which is verse 12, kiss the sun. And here's why I say that. And I've got other notes somewhere in here, <clears throat> and we're almost, I think, getting close to being out of time. Um, <clears throat> we always assume that different scriptures, for example, uh, that talks about him taking a rod of iron and breaking our vessel means that he's destroying us. Okay, let me give you a couple other scenarios. Well, first of all, let me just address the thought that, bring, that comes to that. Our thoughts come to that because we don't know God's heart. Right. 
And I say that, I say that with all my heart. I, even those that God has to deal harshly with, he's trying to make a son out of. Or form Christ in them. Either word you want to use. That's his goal. That's his heart. He doesn't desire that any perish. The scriptures declare that, okay? I believe that he has a plan, and he would take anybody into that plan, okay? So one, one scenario might be that he takes a rod of iron, and he hits our earthen vessel and breaks it so the treasure would be seen. Could that be a possibility? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Bring us more into brokenness, because the more tre a, a vessel is broken, the more you'll see the treasure on the inside. Amen? Okay, so his heart then isn't, yeah, I just hate this earthen vessel. No, no, no. But he does love the treasure. And probably that earthen vessel did a really stupid thing and said, oh, Lord, do whatever you got to do so more of the treasure can be seen. You know, just keep your mouth shut if you don't mean it. You know, because he listens to that and he goes, okay, I'll do that. Thank you for the permission slip. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and so, um, what was the other scenario I was thinking about? Oh, that he, that he will break those single vessels in the resurrection, in his death and in the resurrection. He will break those single vessels. He will, through the cross, break them and on the, in the resurrection bring them into a one vessel, one large, many-membered vessel, us being joined to Christ. And did not Jesus, through the cross, then reach out to the Gentiles and bring them in and, and, and just rake them into the kingdom of God? Yes, they did. Yes. Yes. And the point of that isn't that we make a theological statement. The point of what we're saying is that we see the heart of God. Now, if you don't see the heart of God, if you don't understand his intentions, then you'll read every scripture just like that one and you'll say, yeah, you better turn to the sun. You better... You know, it's like you better get down and kiss his feet or he'll break you like a rod of iron, you know, with a what rod of iron. He'll bust you up, you know. And that's the way most people view God. That's what they see. They say, well, I better follow God or he's going to do terrible things. There are people in this room that think that way about God. On this side of the room, <laughs> right over there. <clears throat> and, and there are plenty of examples whereby we might come to that. But, you know, here's just a thought. I mean, I probably shouldn't. I, I probably should try to keep moving on this. But, I, you know, something's got to break, at least shake your little long-standing views of, how God is. Think about Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So that, you know, the whole deal with the money and they hid money and stuff like this, so, so they died. All right. So we assume that they went to hell. But they didn't necessarily go to hell. We don't know that. Yeah. God's dealing with governmental things in your life. And, but that, there's a larger picture of what he did on the cross that we're saved by grace, folks. He's dealing with you based on governmental things for one purpose, to bring you into the image of Christ. That, and so he does all sorts of stuff. But, folks, there is a bigger picture that this whole thing is by grace. Did you know that? Oh, yeah, I know it, but I better not do that. You know? See, that's how we think. Oh, it's all by grace, but, you know, um, what does that scripture talk about? It's, uh, oh, oh, I'm trying to think of the verse. It's something about the grace of God where um, you, um, 
kind of like you run out the grace of God or something like that. Well, you, if it's grace, you can't run out or overuse it if it's grace. That's just dumb. I mean, it's not to our minds, but I mean, you know, I'm just saying in the reality of things, if it's grace, it's just grace, you know. Um, but we think that I can't go too far here. Okay, when it comes to grace, you can go as far as you want. When it comes to God dealing with you as a son, he's going he's gonna to whip your rear end. Do you understand? You know? And, <laughs> you know, and I, I mean, I, with my wife and kids, I mean, I'm that way. I love them. I stand with I stood with them. But I tell you what, there's certain things that lead to certain other things that you have to correct. And if you don't correct those things, there's going to be problems down the road. But you love them with all your heart. <laughs> you know? And I, from time to time, would say to Deb or the girls, you know, I know I'm just a mean father. Or I'm just a mean husband. But many times they actually knew my heart and would say, no, you're not. You're doing what you do out of love because you care. You know, what does the scripture say? S spare the rod. No, it doesn't say spoil the child. It says hate the child. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's always quoted that way, so that's why we know it that way. But when you look it up in the scripture, it says spoil the rod, hate the child. Well, they say to you, don't spank that kid. If you love your child, you wouldn't spank him. You know? Absolutely, and God spanks us because he loves us. It says that in Hebrews, what, 12. And so we have to be able to see the dealing of God on, on several levels. One is the larger level of grace. The other one is I'm, I'm talking to you. Hey, I'm talking to you, <laughs> you know. You talking to me? <laughs> yes, I'm talking. And then you have to line up and find out what he's doing. And so sometimes he allows stuff. He deals stuff. He, it's not easy and it's not fun, but I tell you what, it says, but the end of it, the fruits thereof are, are incredibly beneficial at the end of the this, this situation. All right, how much time we got left? Is that, was that a peace sign? Yeah. So, so hook them worms, what is that? Anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> so what I was saying of this, this verse, this verse 9, it, with verse 12, is, is let the cross and the resurrection break them so that it can bring them to intimacy where you do kiss the sun, where you are, you know, and, and uh, uh, we're, we're always, you know, and he doesn't say, I will cause you to perish from the way. The way, folks, the way is not just the way of salvation from hell. The way is the nature of Christ becoming your way. It is. It is the nature of Christ becoming your way. Is, has anybody attained that yet that you know of? No. The, these are absolutes, and yet they, they, they're... They fit. No one, no one has measured up to them, but they are absolutes. Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's the absolute. That he may fill all things. There's the absolute. But watch, watch the Apostle Paul in every one of his letters. He starts the first two or three chapters. He deals with the absolutes. And then he starts applying it on their practical earth life level. He starts by talking about, you know, Christ in you, the hope of glory, or, or you're all crucified with Christ, or all of those absolutes that to God they are done and settled and this is the way it should be. But then when he starts dealing with their lives, he starts talking about, you know, that uh, you need to conform to that. You need to, you know, and he'll use even practical things, put off lying. Well, you can't put off lying unless you're dead. But how are you going to know if, that you're not really dead unless you start lying? And I say not really dead where the death has been applied in your life. You are dead. You, that's a settled work. That's an absolute. Is it settled in you? 
Well, that's, that's another situation. All right, let's stop and take a break and we'll come back for that other class, whatever it, it is. And I'm sure that Kelly will write it on the board.